All right, this is section 5.13, uh, steel joist. Um, again, this is just scratching the surface. Uh, there's so much in this topic um, that, that there's so many different things we could cover, but again, just trying to keep it on the surface for you. Um, so let's get started. All right, so bunch of things get tied together here um, very similar to beams as far as establishing loads you can use tributary width for sure um, to obtain <clears throat> distributed uniform loads um, <coughs> and once you have uh, the strength again uh, there are the strength requirement you can select the steel joists and then they also provide um, loading that will help you evaluate the serviceability condition so we'll talk about that there are i guess technically four at least four different series of steel joists and and then if we were to really dig a little deeper we'd find uh, at least one additional a fifth that really isn't you know part of the typical joist but different producers manufacturers provide uh, additional types of joists all right, I'd like you to kind of understand the two different <coughs> web systems within a joist because you, you'll you see them in the field and you should be knowledgeable of the terminology and, and how they're different. Um, we'll look at the different designations and how to, pr how to identify the load that will produce L over 360, and that's pretty easy. It, there's a red number uh, underneath the black number which is the total um, load but the red number is a distributed <coughs> is the distributed load that will produce L over 360 deflection for that given span and that given designation and we'll take a look at that then once you have that data point right remember we're in elastic behavior when we're talking uh, deflection so once we have that value we can then um, ratio to other values such as L over 600, L over 400, whatever displacement you're trying to uh, evaluate. Okay. So steel joists are, are really uh, um, part of, just like AISC has, um, promotes the use of hot rolled shapes. The Steel Joist Institute, the SJI, pr uh, promotes and develops uh, information to help uh, sell more steel joists. So every joist fabricator pays dues to the SJI and the SJI takes that, that money and um, promotes steel joists, sponsors research, tries to you know develop the product uh, and sets the ground rules for competition amongst uh, steel joist fabricators. And they um, implement a uh, an inspection process where representatives from the SJI come and evaluate, <coughs> evaluate the um, fabrication process, the engineering process, sort of like our ABET assessment. Uh, but the SJI does the same thing for each steel joist um, fabricator. Okay, and it is a competitor. Steel joists are com in competition with wide flange beams. So AISC is not a big fan of steel joists, but there certainly is a application form that steel beams just can't compete with. Okay, um, they are standardized. Okay, and they're geared towards uniformly distributed load. Uh, there are economical joist tables. Um, I didn't include one. I had it in in here, but I thought I'd take it out. Um, again, I'm not going to worry about that. Um, but we'll look at some of the standard choice, uh, standard load tables. Okay, they are definitely geared for big quantities, volume, and repetitive um, types. So, if joist fabric here is like one size, one length, one, uh, and lots of them. Okay, so the more they can mass produce, uh, the quicker they can get them done, and the more. Um, economies they can pass on they are great for roofs they're great for you know any type of rectangular bay because you can have multiple of the same joist um, 
bays with um, uneven ends, you know, such as this, uh, that would not be, you know, they specify it, you know, but that would be less economical because every joist is a different length. But it is done, okay? So the bigger the building, the better uh, for steel joists you might want to look at um, because there certainly is economy and scale. We typically don't see them in floors, uh, and the main reason is vibration, okay? There, it's not thoroughly understood how to specify them and eliminate vibration. In order to minimize the vibration, you have to really space them out for far, really load them up so that when people are walking on them, they're not so much of an impact on on the loading. Um, so it, it's it's not very typical that you see them in floors. Okay. There is an ASD and an LRFD specification, just like the steel manual. LRFD numbers are blue, ASD numbers are green. <clears throat> K series. There's there's uh, this. The original is the K series, or the the current one is the K series, and within that's the KCS. And the CS stands for constant shear. And this is helpful when you don't know where loads are, okay, like a concentrated load. A standard K-series joist for the shear diagram, right, for uniform load, you would expect this, okay? But the SGI says, hey, I'm going to have a minimum of 25% of the reaction, if this is R, I'm going to have 25% of that reaction as my minimum shear, so that I don't have any really small web members uh, that if they see a stress reversal, they would go from tension into compression, they'd be a problem, okay? So um, KCS um, are just a different type of animal, a constant shear joist. The shear diagram for them is um, constant, so every uh, web member sees the same force, uh, but it's not a very economical solution, but it provides you flexibility on loading. Again, try not to get into the weeds. I'm just trying to stay above it. All right, but I would like you to see and know what the difference between a round bar web and a crimped angle web is, right? A round bar web is you, uh, the fabricators buy bars of different diameters that are typically 60 feet in length. Okay, and then they have a mechanism that will take this bar and bend it into, we would call them V's, but it bends them into this, and then you cut it. Okay, so then you'd have a W, maybe you'd have a three panel V. Uh, you really didn't have a single V, you'd have at least two, maybe go four. Okay, but it would take this round bar, so say it's a seven eighth inch round bar, they take that and bend it into these W's or V's, and that will serve as a web member. <clears throat> Versus on the crimped angle, you take a equal leg angle and you kind of bend these in so that it looks like that. Okay, and what's nice there is you kind of get that down to like a one inch width. Okay, and it's going to fluctuate because there's it's not an exact science. Um, and, you know, they're more rounded and then those quick edge, those sharp edges there. Um, but it does work. Okay. It does work. And there's the trade-offs, right? Um, the round bar web, less labor, but you're wasting material. The angle, the crimped angle is you're got member sized exactly for the forces that they need, but you're placing lots of them. Okay. Uh, so again, it, that's all within the purview of the fabricator and they figure out what's the most economical way to work all right in addition to the k series we have lh long span joist and then we have dlh which is deep long span joist uh, lh joists are single and typically double angle web dlh most likely gonna <laughs> have double angle web and then joist girders uh, are more like uh, trusses that support 
other joists. So they get a series of concentrated loads. What I haven't said, you know, but um, I'll say it now, is the cross section looks like this, right? A pair of equal leg angles, right? So maybe three by three by a quarter, right? Angle three by three by a quarter. This one might be angle two and a half by two and a half by an eighth, okay? But a pair of equal leg angles, and then in between, if you have the crimped angle shape, it looks like this, and then it flares out. Okay, and then here's the heel down the back. If it's a round bar, it's just, you know, that bent round bar in there, okay? So everything's equal leg angle. Um, for joist girders, the engineer specifies the depth. So they might say, you know, 32G for girder, 32 for depth. Then 5N for spacing, spaces. And then say 17 kips total load. Okay, so this would represent one, two, three, four, five. So five spaces one, two, three, four, five of a joist girder that's 32 inches deep. All right, and then the fabricator will decide do I do this? How do I most economical, economically solve this problem, okay, from a trust standpoint? And each, <coughs> each one of these would be 17 kips. Now, you got to be careful. Is that factor load? Is that service load? Again, try not to get into the weeds. I'm going to just leave it at that. And move on okay so here's some old videos that I resurrected or found um, of where I used to work my former life and this is a short little video of how K series joists with round bar web are fabricated okay again uh, this is the stocking uh, area so the the long round bar is being bent in the background and then cut and then put into these these uh, racks right so you can see uh, here there's a, a a bent round bar okay uh, let me try this All right so you can see here's a bent round bar and actually it looks like it's hanging off a little further down here's another one all right and notice they're all stacked up so as they know how many they're going to build they know how many pieces they need so they get it all ready to go for the riggers okay so this is the first step in it uh, again there's no sound um, but you can see the rigging table um, and again the uh, shop labor right so they're placing the the angles first all right lift them up over their heads so they're placing this angle oh let me stop this all right can't see so they placed this angle on the table this angle on the table now they're laying in these round bar W's, right? These bent, these bent webs. Okay. Notice they're placing them multiple pieces at a time, right? So this is all one web member, and it's going to be based off of one the maximum compression force in that truss analysis. Okay. So that's what engineering would do. Okay. So they have all those web placed. Now they're putting the top cord on and they're clamping it together. Okay. So as they clamp it, they use those vice grips. Okay. And if you do that for an hour, the palm of your hand, you know, I don't know how these guys do this stuff all day long. 
Um, but they clamp it together, make some fine tune adjustments, and then they stand it up, top cord down, and send it down to the next stage, okay? And they typically stack them into what we would call a bundle. So this joist, as it's clamped together, would go to the next station, kind of wait there until these guys got maybe two more put together, and then I'll show you why. Um, they, they put them into a bundle of three or four, as many as they can, okay? And this is the same type of process, but for a uh, crimped angle, okay? So, again, these guys are placing, you know, the one angle first. Then they're placing, notice each angle is being set individually, okay? Um, and notice this area is different, right? So this area is different than before. So there's a stalker who's uh, S-T-O-C-K-E-R, not S-T-A-L-K-E-R, a stalker who puts all the single angle webs of the appropriate size, appropriate length into position so the guy's rigging can put them in the right spot. Okay, so more labor. Notice how they're tack welding it together here instead of clamping because all those pieces are individual. Okay. Then they so they got those angles in place. Now they put the second part on top. Right again, uh, tack it together so it stays, and they will still clamp it, but they do the little tacks uh, to keep it together. And as they <coughs> right as they rig that thing together, they look for you know things that are not quite right because they know the welders have to get in there the next station. And they got to make sure that things are tight enough and gaps are closed. So sometimes you got to close the gap. And then sometimes more you might want to, but then you decide not to close the gap. Okay. Um, so now this thing is done. It's rigged. It's tacked together. They stand it up on the top cord, see how flimsy it is, and send it down to the next station. And it's the same process, just a little bit bigger than the round bar web so the crimped angle web get to be bigger and longer okay so again crimp crimp crimped angle takes this angle and bends it down into this so that this one inch gap is this one inch gap okay and then it has this little bit of a flare again it's tough for me to draw it with any um, all right so now now we get into what we call finish welding okay so now I'm back to the round bar the small guys so these things are clamped together see the round bars again this is going to be the bottom cord or the tension member this is the top cord or the compression member but as we ship it <laughs> or send it down the line they always stand it on um, the top cord and notice there's three joists here one two three and there's also three stand you know in a, in a bundle here okay so these things are getting ready to go into the finish weld pit so these rollers you know they all activate and you know try to make things more efficient notice all the clamps um, someone's job is to knock all those clamps off they fall onto a belt underneath it there this flipper was a was a game changer right so now it sets down so now they're welding these things are stacked on top of each other so the welders are welding downhand right so everything is working with gravity right so you know, one guy's welding over here, another guy's welding over here. It flips over, and then now the welded part is on top. So now they just have to weld the bottom part. So it's all about speed and efficiency, um, but as you can imagine, speed and efficiency sometimes doesn't lend itself well to quality. So you got to balance that, okay? The last part is... Uh, inspection and painting 
this fellow here, this is Ed, um, oh, what the heck is his last name? Eddie, Eddie, I don't know, Eddie was what I, Ed, I'll think of it, Ed, um, but Ed would do inspection, Ed was a great guy, um, and then it got, they would, they would dip coat it, okay, so notice how many joists are hanging there, probably nine or ten, and these are crimped angle joists, okay, notice the, notice the, um, the web configuration of the truss, again, it's upside down, Eddie Andrews, that's the guy's name, so when you look at it, this from the side, notice, ah, dang it, um, All right, notice the web. It's upside down, so this is the top cord. This is the bottom cord. So here's the web system, okay? Different than if it were a round bar web, okay? So there's the web system, and uh, the only way they get painted is if you dip them. So it's not a real pretty kind of paint, uh, but it just keeps helps keep them from rusting. This is... Um, Long span DLH and girders. Notice the notice the rollers, right? So this table is really designed to fabricate up to um, I think we did 14 feet deep or maybe even 15 feet deep, but it got a little challenging with shipping. So this is a tiny little truss being built on this big table, okay? Um, but these are you know larger loads, larger angles. Um, they they weld them in place, tack weld them in place, rig it up, uh, get it pretty solid, and then send it down to the finish welders. And these ones usually get built one at a time. Okay, this is a pretty small one here, but there's a nice picture of a bigger one uh, coming up. So, but you can see, you know, they're pretty flimsy when they're by themselves and you hoist them up with a with a cable okay there's a bigger joist probably a joist girder some pretty sizable seats <clears throat> this one's probably a joist girder going to receive a series of concentrated loads on the top cord but you know it's not the most stable thing by itself again think unbraced length and compression lateral torsional buckling all that good stuff okay so they're flipping this one over in order to weld the other side. <laughs> All right. Um, this is the painting process. You can see how great uh, it is. Um, check out all the little drips of paint that have dried uh, on there. And this is really the, the most efficient and proper, you know, re it's, it's enough, okay? So the bundle of joist again, <laughs> hanging upside down with the top cord down so center of gravity is as low as possible this paint just smells so good these this thing on the right is a lid and at the end of the day or the end of the shift this lid closes it rotates down to try to you know minimize um voc exposure okay but see how great that is you just dip that puppy down in there uh, a little murky gray you get two choices well you get three choices gray red or no paint okay then they lift it up <coughs> one end higher than the other to try to drain the paint off as much as possible okay you let it hang there for a little till all that stuff you know sort of stops um sort of stops um, draining then you put it on the truck and hopefully the sun's out and it dries okay um, so that's pretty much the fabrication process now I'd like to kind of just review the designation and the specifying process all right so K series Joyce again the first number is the depth so this is about nominal depth, I'll say. This is depth. So this is 8 inch, 14, 
16. Certainly the K, hopefully is obvious. K series Joyce. And the one versus the six versus the three is really just a relative um, indicator of the angle sizes, okay? Uh, six is bigger than one, three is bigger than one, six is bigger than three. And you can see the designation. So for a 14 inch deep joist, you have K1s, K3s, K4s, and K6. K6 is going to be stronger than K1. It's also going to be heavier than K1. And there is a, there's more I could tell you about that, but it's, again, it's, I'm just trying to give you the, the, the 25 cent tour. Okay. So you see here, nominal depth, 10, 12, 14, 16, 16. Here's approximate weight per foot, right? They, so again, K6 is way more than a, a K1. Okay. I can't resist tell you this one. Okay. So K6 here versus a K6 here, same combination of angles, just this one's 16 inches deeper than, or two inches deeper than the 14 K. So it changes the moment capacity. Okay. So anyways, uh, most importantly is remember that the bigger the K number, the larger the capacity. Okay. So it's pretty straightforward, right? We, this is LRFD table. So you're most likely dealing with 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live or roof load. Okay. You get that factored load. You have a span, you have a load, you come over here, you pick a black number that works and that's your designation. So you start here, go across to this and then go up to the designation. Now this red number, okay? I'm sorry, wait, before I go further, notice that, all right, um, looking for, as we go across this way, right, the capacity goes up, 528, 661, 795. But notice as we go down or increase in span, so for a given 14K1, at 14 feet it has 825 factored load capacity. As our span increases, look what happens to the, the uniform load. Okay, it goes down because this combination of cords only has one moment capacity. So M is fixed. M, M stays the same, it's constant, but W, L squared over eight, as the L changes, that's 18 squared, 21 squared, eight stays the same, this stays the same cause the angles top and bottom are the same. So the only thing that can adjust is the uniform load. So as L goes up, W goes down. Okay, because this stays the same. Now this red number, right? This red number, well, I'll wait to explain that on the next one, but the red number always means the same thing um, for the tables in here, okay? LH series, again, same thing. 24 LH is the depth. 06 is a specific combination of top chord angle size with a bottom chord angle size. LH11 are bigger angles than LH 06s. Same condition with uh, the black number is the, the maximum load that the joist can support, the factor distributed load. Now the red number, the red number, the red, W red, if you will, is the load that will produce L over 360 deflection. Okay, so this is a service load. So what this is telling me, a 24 LH07 that spans 39 feet, 320 pounds a foot will produce L over 360 deflection. So 39 times 12 divided by 360. Notice these tables are arranged a little differently. 
choice designation down the left side spans across to the right and again notice for LH07 shortest span has maximum capacity longest span has least capacity again because this joist has one given moment capacity based on its top cord and bottom cord so as span increases load decreases okay so again um, the red number this is the service load that produces L over 360 deflection okay again I know it's hard to see there uh, but W red produces L over 360 deflection <clears throat> okay same for the 52 DLHs but notice how much longer we're getting okay um, the third the I should have said this right the K series right these go up max span is 60 feet max depth 30 inches okay so there's a range that these are applicable okay so again um, the blue and the red that means something but again I'm trying to keep it um, pretty light for you okay <clears throat> same thing depth relative cord size capacity and factored load distributed service load that will produce L over 360 okay so everything is based on uniformly distributed loads we can accommodate concentrated loads there is a way to do that again I'm going to try to not get sucked in there, okay? I'd love to show you, but I don't want to <clears throat> drag it on any longer than I have to, okay? So, again, this is my strength. And this is my serviceability. Okay? So here's, you know, an example uh, maybe I ought to pause this and I'll load the example as a, a different video since it's been a half hour already. Or, oh, nah. Yeah, I guess I'll. Nah, I'll keep going. What the heck? All right. Why stop now? Shouldn't take me too long. All right. So here's a span. If I want to. This is a, here's a joist off of a framing plan 20K6. So I'm just going to kind of size it and see if we get that. We may not get the exact same joist, but let's just go through the process. So span is 30 feet. Spacing is five. So it's five this way. Five this way. So that means my tributary width is five feet right because I'm gonna see all of this loading on that span okay my live load limit is L over 240 right again I don't have to really calculate it I just need to know what it is and understand how to use it <clears throat> okay so my my factored distributed load is gonna be 1.2 times 20 plus 1.6 times 35 all right this is all pounds per foot squared and then I'm going to take all of that and multiply it by five feet and that gives me 400 pounds per foot so that's the factored load that this joist has to support and I have to support the live load or the snow load at L over 240 of 35 so I'd have to check for service loads 35 times 5 which is 175 pounds per foot okay so that's the, really the design criteria <clears throat> so I'll go through that one more time here okay and should be good shape right so span 
is 30 feet. My tributary width is 5 over 2 plus 5 over 2, which is 5 feet. Okay. My W sub U, my factored distributed load, is going to be 1.2 times uh, my dead load is 20 PSF. My snow is 35 PSF pounds per foot squared. So 1.2 times 20 plus 1.6 times 35 all times 5 feet gives me 400 pounds per foot. My W snow, which is service, is going to be uh, 35 pounds per foot squared times 5 feet, which is going to be 175 pounds per foot. Okay. <clears throat> so strength, right? So now I know my, let me pick a joist for strength based on strength, and then I'll check it for deflection. And again, just like in beams, sometimes deflection controls over strength. Okay. And just like beams also rarely does shear control. Okay. So strength. So I need a W sub U of 400 pounds per foot at a span of 30 feet. So I'm going to go to the, I brought this joist table in uh, from the steel, from the SGI uh, book. Here's my span, 30 feet. I want to find a joist that has more capacity than 400. So that's going to be this one, uh, this one, and this one. And that's going to take me up to 18K5, 20K4, or a 22K4. Okay. And I want to make note of what the self weight is. And you can imagine which one I want to use. I want to use the lightest uh, joist that we see. So it looks like the 20K4 is going to be the one. Okay. So let's make those notes before we forget. All right. So for strength, 18K5 has, uh, oops, all right, let me, 414 capacity, and it weighs 7.7 .7 pounds per foot. All right, so capacity, <clears throat> self weight. Then the 20K4, right? The 20K4, its capacity is 411. And its self weight is 7.2. And then finally, the 22K4. Its capacity is 4453 pounds per foot, and its self weight is 7.3 pounds per foot. Again, these may not be exact, but they're close enough that we can compare. So it looks to me like if deflection checks, you would use a 20K4. <clears throat> so now I want to check the serviceability, right? The serviceability. All right. So my W service, my W snow is 175 pounds per foot, right? And I want to check it against... Checked for L over 240. Okay, and if I go back to my load tables and I look here, 
All right, I look at my 20K4, my number is 179. All right, so this number here is 179. All right, so 179 is the load that will produce L over 360. So W red is 179 pounds per foot. Okay, but that's for L over 360. Now notice L over 360 is more stringent than L over 240, so it definitely works. Okay, but what if the check was for L over 480? Right, what if my um, deflection limit was L over 480? It was more stringent than L over 360. I could figure out what deflection will produce L over 480. Okay, so what, or I'm sorry, what load? So what load produces deflection of L over 480? And it's really just a, a ratio, like every most everything else we do. We're going to take a ratio of, <clears throat> we're almost done. We're going to take a ratio of uh, 179 produces L over 360. We want to find out what load produces L over 480. So I just use a ratio, all right? So if I know that 179 produces L over 360 or 1 over 360 of span, that equals what load proportional to 1 over 480, okay? So now I find out that that uniform load there is, all right, 179 multiplied by 1 over 480 divided by 1 over 360 is only 134 pounds per foot. So 134 pounds a foot will produce a delta of L over 480, all right? So you can use ratios because it's elastic behavior. Okay. <clears throat> so we can use all these tools here for a lot of different conditions. All right. All right. I know that's... That's almost 45 minutes. That's like a whole class, right? So <clears throat> now you know who the man of steel joist is, okay? All right. Again, I should put my face in there, right? But uh, anyways. All right. Let me know if you have questions.